Welcome to the Field Studies Council event for Biology Week. Please be aware the sound quality varies throughout the recording. We hope this doesn't affect your enjoyment of the programme. Hello and welcome to Field Studies Council audio programme for Biology Week. We are delighted to be hosting this programme as part of the Royal Society of Biology's annual event and we'd love for you to get involved via social media using hashtag Biology Week. You will also find information to complement the audio recording on Field Studies Council website. Please see the link in the description below for more details. I'm Amy Bandranayaka and I'm the Digital Learning Officer for Field Studies Council. This year the Field Studies Council is celebrating its 80th anniversary. The organisation is an environmental education charity that helps people learn about the environment and engage with the outdoors. Its mission is to create outstanding opportunities for everyone to learn about nature. Founded in 1943, the first field study centre, Flatford Mill, famous for being featured in paintings by John Constable, opened in 1946. A small number of highlights in the organisation's 80-year history include a change of name in 1955 from Council for the Promotion of Field Studies to Field Studies Council, much less of a mouthful, I think we can all agree. 1980 saw a royal visit to Field Studies Council Slapton in Devon from Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip. The publications unit opened in 1989 and continues to sell their informative and colourful identification keys alongside other items for wildlife lovers. The most recent Field Study Centre to be added to 18 other locations across the UK is Bishop's Wood in North Worcestershire, which opened in 2016. Even when COVID forced centres to shut in 2020, Field Studies Council continued to engage learners through hashtag FieldworkLive and hashtag Primary Nature Live online programmes, reaching over 390,000 online learners from 32 nations during the lockdowns. Field Studies Council is also known for delivering natural history courses and since 2021, these courses have been organised centrally by our biodiversity team, which works with a network of expert tutors in the design, development and delivery of progressive learning content across all natural history subjects for both online and in-person courses. There are currently over 200 fascinating courses available each year. A lot of the teaching and learning that goes on is with school children of all ages that visit our centres to carry out geography or biology fieldwork or enjoy adventures in nature. Across all Field Studies Council locations there are 85 tutors and the biodiversity team is supported by over 200 associate tutors. The tutors are highly skilled in delivering fieldwork but also have specific ecology topics that they are interested in. These topics range from freshwater ecology to badgers. I have three tutors with me here today to discuss their passions for ecology, share their knowledge with each other and with you, the listener. So let's introduce them. First, Amy Hopley, a senior tutor at Millport, a Field Studies Council Centre on the Isle of Cumbrae in Scotland. The centre is located on the Firth of Clyde and has a rich history as a marine research station. So it's no surprise that with a degree in marine biology, Amy has found herself working in this location and is here today to share some of her knowledge on the subject. Welcome, Amy. Hi. Next, we have Cam Jaramillo, a tutor at one of our Welsh centres, Margham Discovery Centre. The centre is a state-of-the-art, low-carbon footprint building set in 850-acre country estate. The area is one of Wales's richest bat nesting locations and home to approximately 600 deer. It also offers a range of ecosystems from freshwater ponds and streams to mixed woodland and grassland. Cam, affectionately known as the Pond Man, is here to share his knowledge on freshwater ecology, particularly amphibians and invertebrates. Hello Cam. Hello. Finally, Morag Boyd joins us as an associate tutor working with the biodiversity team. Based in Scotland, Morag is a countryside professional with 30 years experience working in a range of countryside and conservation professions. Alongside her tutor role, she also works with Scottish Badgers, recruiting and training volunteers for the National Get Set Scottish Badger Survey and runs her own outdoor nature education business. Morag has a broad knowledge of many different aspects of ecology and conservation, but is here today mainly to discuss badgers. Hi Morag. Hi there. It's lovely to have all three of you here today for this Biology Week programme. I'm a geographer by trade, so I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot today. One thing that does connect you all is wildlife conservation. So how about we start with Amy? What's your experience of wildlife conservation? 
Um, so before I started to work for the FSC, I worked for five years in uh, wildlife conservation, like particularly coastal conservation and particularly um, with public engagement side of things. So I've been very lucky to have lots of jobs where I spend lots of time outside looking at wildlife and pointing wildlife out to people and making people say wow about the wild animals that we have um, around our coasts in the UK. Awesome. And um, Cam, does that kind of link to similar things that you've done or have you kind of taken a different path down wildlife conservation? Yeah, I guess I've kind of come from a similar background. Didn't spend as much time before I started in the FSC, did a bit, uh, sort of did uh, wildlife conservation at uni and then um, worked with Bristol Zoo for a bit and then a couple of wildlife trusts before before starting with us. But something I've always been interested in. And uh, I know that it's kind of part of what you were doing was looking at newts, counting newts. Um, how was that? Where, where did you undertake that work? Um, I did that with, with Bristol Zoo. So I worked with their native species team um, and they've just moved now. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Bristol Zoo, but they've just moved from their site in Clifton, which was like the oldest, one of the oldest zoos in the world. Had to close that down because it was a bit too small. And they've got a new one now out uh at Cribs Causeway called Wild Place and that before they were developing that because this was would have been about 2018 um, there were lots of ponds on site already and we were having a look at what newts were there especially the great crested newt because um, as a protected species you can't uh, develop um, on land where you're going to be disturbing their habitat so yeah I was looking at um, how far they were traveling which ponds they were in um, and different factors that were affecting that. Amazing thank you um, so Council and County Newts Morag your current work is all about Counting badgers. Uh, tell us a bit about what the Get Set Scottish Badger Survey is all about. Sure. Um, Get Set Scotland is a second survey. It's a second survey that we have done across the whole of Scotland. The first survey was done about 15 years ago to find out the numbers of badger sets and the distribution of badger sets across Scotland. Um, we're now resurveying the same 1,000 squares as we surveyed first time round to find out if the badgers are still there or not, if the badgers have moved, and if the habitats where the badger sets were originally found, if those have changed. So it's a very extensive survey requiring the involvement of hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. And my job is to recruit and train those volunteers to be able to notice and record signs of badgers in the wild. Amazing. So for all, if there's any sort of easy kind of things to look out for in terms of spotting badgers in their uh, areas when they next go on a countryside walk? The first thing to look for is uh, snuffle holes, which is actually the correct scientific ecological term for the hole that a badger makes with its nose when it is rooting the ground for worms. Um, so you get a little hole, they stick their nose into the ground, you get a little hole that's kind of the size and shape of a paper cup. Um, quite distinctive, and uh, when they when they suck out the worm, they'll they'll leave that wee hole behind. Um, so snuffle holes and general scrapes and scratches in the ground and on trees are the the main kind of signs. Combined with badger badger highways, badger paths. So that's the first thing we look for is we find badger paths, and once we find a badger path, we follow that, and hopefully we find snuffle holes, and then hopefully those increase, and eventually hopefully we end up at a set. Amazing. Um, never heard of snuffle holes before. Uh, <laughs> Amy, do you think you've seen any snuffle holes on your countryside walks? I don't know. Now you've mentioned it, maybe it's something I need to look out for. I think I've seen um, the sort of badger highways, you know, in the spring when the bluebells come out. Because I think when the bluebells get trampled, they don't grow back for a couple of years. They don't flower there for a couple of years. So you can follow the, the gaps in the bluebells. Um, so I need to follow one and see if I can find a set. Um, so that's on my to-do list. But... We don't actually have any badgers on Cumbrae, so we don't no, have any badgers don't. on this island. So, um, yeah, so it's a job when I'm on the mainland. No, fair enough. <laughs> um, so just thinking about wildlife conservation, I mean, it, it sounds incredibly interesting and um, obviously all really passionate about it. Um, what are some of the kind of challenges uh, that you encountered or, you know, even the best bits or other rewards of doing wildlife conservation? Um, Amy, we'll come to you first. Yeah, um, I think particularly um, one of the challenges is that people don't really know much about 
the environment, the wild animals that we have here in the UK and the habitats that we have in the UK. Um, and, you know, it's like one of those things that we always love to say during session during the start of like field trips is that like people don't care about what they can't see. Um, so I think half the challenge is getting people to see the things that we're talking about, um, which can be really difficult when it's like the big charismatic stuff like badgers and um, things like that, that you don't get to see all the time. And certainly in the marine environment, it takes a lot of patience if you want to see some of the really exciting stuff. Um, so, but then again, you've also got to try and get people to look down at the little stuff that's there as well. And um, so sort of, catching people's attention can be tricky sometimes I think and getting them to start to delve deeper into what we have in this country in terms of wildlife. Yeah absolutely. Um, Pam, any particular challenges you've encountered while doing your conservation work? Yeah I think I think everyone who has done conservation work will agree with this that um, you kind of accept that you're going to be out and about in all, all weathers, all times of year, um, especially with newt surveys, badgers, bat surveys, you're going to be out at dusk and dawn um, if you're doing certain things so you kind of just accept that your hours are all over the place and, and busy seasons generally like new, new survey season is from sort of uh, March through to to May start of June and that's night time setting out all these traps and doesn't matter if it's raining doesn't matter if it's hailing you, you kind of got to do it um, but it, I think it's worth it when you get to get to hold on to a great Christian newt. Uh, which I was lucky because I was trapping ponds that I knew that they were in. It's a little bit different when you're trapping ponds trying to find them. Um, and I can imagine that's a bit more disappointing if you have to turn up and all the traps are empty. So, Laura, how about you? Particular challenges of your conservation work? I think, I mean, of, of my badger work, the challenges are, again, the weather. The weather is a challenge in badger survey season is autumn and early spring. We shut down for, for a couple of months in the middle of winter. Um, so we hit the, the worst of the worst weather when we're surveying, which is, is great. And the, the other challenge is that badgers, um, badgers do what they do, where they do it. And we have to go where the badgers are. And quite often that can be in the middle of the densest spruce plantation that there is around. Um, we had a lovely survey training day where we went out um followed badger paths and we followed several badger paths and they brought us up to the edge of this, the most dense black thorn thicket you'd ever found so we went around the edges of this black thorn thicket trying it we wanted to find the set trying to find the set but of course black thorn being black thorn if you get a black thorn scratch it doesn't heal and so we couldn't go in there and we we're pretty convinced that the badgers were building their set right in the middle of that dense protective black thorn thicket which makes a lot of sense but for us who want to count the number of set entrances and uh, categorize them and decide whether it's a main set or whether it's an outlier set um it's yeah the the countryside itself can be the challenge for for us when we're doing our surveys clever badgers by the sound of it very inconsiderate badgers <laughs> In terms of trapping, like they don't like getting in traps either. I did a bit of vaccination um, before, and it's just you spend weeks and weeks just baiting the traps because, and you'll camera trap them, and you'll see they'll walk right up to the door, and then they'll be like, "No, I'm not going in there." Which is so <laughs> annoying. Badgers are they're they're really really clever, and there's so much because they're nocturnal and because they live underground. There's so much about them that we don't know. Um, we and there's so much about them that they keep contradicting us. You think you know something, you'll tell all your volunteers this is you know, a fact about badgers and then you'll find out that somebody's got a camera trap out and seen the badger doing the complete opposite of that. Um, so they, they seem to have it in their heads that they're going to contradict me every time I, I try and teach anybody anything. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. So does that kind of rank up there with some of the best bits of your wildlife conservation work? Is that just finding out new stuff? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was out this weekend um, surveying training with um, a lady who's done lots and lots of badger um, research and I learned so much just from her about stuff that I thought was fact um, that she was saying no 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 that's not actually the way it works and um, they don't do that here um, but they do do it over there and uh, it's just yeah learn I've learned I've been in the job for a year now and I have learned so much in that year it's been absolutely amazing and you know you, you get 30 years into a conservation career and you kind of think what's left to to, to learn well you know, move into specializing something like badgers um there's so much to learn that sounds amazing um amy what about you what any best bits um i think i agree with more i like um 
every time you learn something new it's like a little like spark goes off in your head um so and the more you learn it feels like the more that spurs you on to learn more so um yeah it's just really rewarding in that sense and then um my favorite thing is when you share something that you've just learned with someone else and you see their little face light up um that's my favorite bit so for example when i'm explaining to some of our primary school students about how a, a starfish eats by spitting out its stomach and wrapping it around its prey and then sucking it all back in and they have like, a horrified look on their face like i've just told them about an alien that's landed um that's really really rewarding for me yeah i feel like i'm quite horrified by that as well <laughs> <laughs> But just giving people like the opportunity to see like something completely new or like experience something new is like really rewarding as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cam, how about you? Your best bit? Yeah, I think I think the same. Especially when you're teaching and and working with um, sort of people who aren't as familiar with the environment, you you do learn a lot of the interesting facts. Um, generally, in fresh water, that's things breathing through their bum hole. Um, that's that's always <laughs> a good one. For, good one for the kids. Um, but yeah, just trying to engage gauge younger people or people who wouldn't otherwise be interested in the environment in it, um, like we've kind of co- commented on before. People don't know, that's why they're not interested. It's not that they don't care, but as soon as you get them engaged, look, you know, you could find this in your park, in your garden, it's in the stream that you walk past every day, then they actually think when they go home and they go, yeah, I'm gonna go and look now, I'm gonna go and do this. That's always like the best feeling, I think. Yeah, I know from my experience of teaching at Amersham that you know, the the primary school children that come to do pond dipping, they could literally stay there for hours, just dipping, looking, working out what's what. I mean, obviously they want to find a newt, um, yes. but there are other things they find interesting too. Once they found the newts, I think that sometimes that's it. You've, you've lost them then. They're like, wow, we found a lizard, a dragon. And then I'm like, no, it's not. And actually, we should probably leave it alone. We can look at everything else. But I, I always find that great diving beetle larvae are the thing that, uh, particularly when they're eating a tadpole, that's that's really, really exciting. Um, you know, the kids will have one or two responses, which is, oh, my goodness, that's amazing. Or to, oh, good grief, shouldn't we be, be splitting them up and stopping them from doing that? And you're like, but that's nature. That's how it how nature works and that's you know it's eating its dinner okay so now we move on to the section of the program i've named show and tell each guest has brought along something related to their area of interest in ecology so amy uh, let's start with you uh, what have you got to show us and uh, maybe cam you can describe uh, what you're looking at for the benefits of those at home um, okay, so I was just going to like do a little introduction. So um, I spend a lot of time out on the rocky shore. So we do lots of rocky shore surveys, which I absolutely love. Uh, the rocky shore is a fantastic place to study biology. Um, there's loads of different sort of taxa, loads of different phylums that you don't get anywhere else apart from in the sea. Um, and it's a good place to see like a big mishmash of everything. So people are always excited to find the crabs and the starfish and the fish. Um, but one thing that's like often overlooked is um, barnacles. So I've got some barnacles here to show you guys. So um, if you don't know what a barnacle is, the best way to describe it is um, the sort of crusty things that grow on rocks at the beach um, that you've probably at some point fallen over and grazed yourself on. Um, They don't look like they do anything. They don't seem like they're very interesting. Um, But actually, they are really interesting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen um, and I've hooked up to a um, digital microscope so I can show you um, some live barnacles um, feeding. Oh, wow. Can you see that? Yeah, I guess. That's amazing. So all I've got is a little, um, a little, a few rocks with uh, barnacles on it and I've put them in some seawater um, and then they've just it. Cam, you can describe what the what it is that they're doing. Yeah, I guess when you're looking at them um, outside of the water, they're not they're not doing anything, and you can't really tell that they're alive. But we can see they're kind of opening up like little. Uh, to me, it looks like they're opening up a little mouth and then sticking their tongue out and looking it around. That's what it looks like to me. But yeah, <laughs> or maybe yeah, blink, blinking eyes as well. Yeah, maybe something uh, something weird and wonderful like that. Um, what I always describe it as is um, they open up like a little trap door and then these like feathery appendages that are coming out, um, they're actually modified legs. So barnacles are crustaceans, so they're related to crabs and lobsters. Um, but they, instead of having legs to 
crawl around on. Um, they have they don't need those. They spend their lives being stuck down to the rock. Um, so instead, they use their leg appendages as sort of ways to catch um, plankton, uh, algae that's floating by. Um, so you can see them in this video um, sort of opening. Those legs are coming out and they're grabbing uh, the sort of microscopic particles that are in the water, um, which is really good. It looks really cool to see. Um, but also it's really important because they are filter feeders. So they're taking the microscopic like algae out of the water they are like cleaning the water. So they're taking the nutrients from there and um, sort of cleaning the water so it doesn't get filled with algal blooms. So they are really, really important. Yeah, wow, that's cool. Amazing, thanks for that, Amy. Um, Cam, you're up next. Okay. Amy, maybe you could uh, say for us what, what you can see. So it looks like some sort of egg, something growing in an egg. I don't know what it is. Cam, do you want to tell us a little bit about it and, and why you chose it as your show and tell? Yeah, so it's the development of, this is a salamander because it's um was the only video that I could find. It, it, I can't imagine that this was a very easy video for somebody to take. Um, it's sort of the close-up of a salamander egg and the development inside that egg. Um, I guess most people would see have seen something similar to this with sort of frog spawn and tadpoles, um, but our sort of salamanders and newts look a little bit different. Um, they kind of get these um, gills around their heads that look a little bit like axolotls. Um, and I just think it's pretty amazing how that how they develop um, kind of out of these these eggs and then, um, yeah, hatch out into the water like that. So, so do they hatch out, I suppose, to a newt that has a newt pole and that turns into an adult newt? Does a salamander hatch out as the adult form of the salamander? No, so it still will have that sort of metamorphosis similar to frogs, um, but it's a um, sort of, they, they lay the eggs individually rather than in big groups like the tadpoles. You generally don't see anywhere near as many as you would um, in terms of frog spawn and frogs, um, but they turn into, so they kind of look like that axolotl with, uh, so they'll have all their legs, all four legs, um, and their tails in the water for qu quite a while and then those gills around the head and when they lose those gills um, that's generally when they start to leave the water and they're known, known as a sort of juvenile eft um, which sometimes they'll overwinter in the ponds um, other times they'll sort of find a little nice hibernaculum um, like a pile of logs or something outside of the pond where they'll stay uh, over the winter and then in the spring um, probably depending on how big they are they'll either return to the pond for feeding or they'll return to the pond to breed and generally they like to return to the same ponds um, that they hatched out from uh, unless there's a lot of competition there and then they'll try and find some, some other ponds nearby but um, yeah I just thought it was quite a nice little thing to see uh, that video. More egg last but not least um, yeah. I don't know whether you want to give it a little introduction or whether you just want to show us and I'll get Amy to describe what what you're showing yeah you. well I've, I've actually got two as of the weekend somebody gave me a present which is really nice so i'll show you this one first and then we can look at it and compare it to the differences of the other one and um, so hopefully this will this will show fairly clearly oh, yeah. uh that looks like a badger skull <laughs> yep it assuming it's badgers if you're if you're in badgers <laughs> definitely a mammal so yeah this is a this is a female badger skull um we we know that well I'll, I'll show you the mail. I've been given a mail one as well, which I'm really excited about. Um, it's a bit daft being so excited. About <laughs> I got this, this one. Um, it's got slightly less teeth available to me to see than the female. Um, but the interesting and the unusual things about badger skulls is, first of all, this here, which is a crest that we call the sagittal crest. Um, all mustelids, so all members of the mustelid family, which badgers are in, have a sagittal crest. Um, and that is where the muscles that power the jaw attach to. And this is one of the reasons that badgers have such a strong and powerful bite. Um, so this one we know is a male because his sagittal crest is much more pronounced than my little girly here, um, who I'm quite attached to. So she's got a much smaller sagittal crest on the top of her skull. Um, so the other interesting thing you'll see with both of them 
Um, when you find a skull in the wild of any mammal, generally you find the top part of the skull or the lower jaw. You don't generally find both of them together. And badgers are unusual in that they have a hinge, so a bony hinge that attaches their lower jaw to their upper jaw. Most mammals only have a muscular hinge that joins the lower jaw to the upper jaw. Um, so if you do find a badger skull, the chances are both parts of it are going to be there. So this chap actually found this one, my volunteer found this one um, at the side of the road and they uh, took it away and cleaned it up for me, brought it along as a, as a little present. So that, that that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's probably a bit strange to have, to get really excited about being given a, a skull, but uh, um, I, have, yeah. I have a shelf of skulls at home as well. <laughs> I, think, I do think it's an it's it, environmental <laughs> thing is collecting dead or dying things. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then restoring them. How, how do you know why they have that bony hinge? Um, it's just uh, it's just for the power of the bite. Right. Um, it means that, which is a little bit strange because badgers now in this country generally only eat worms. Well, not only eat worms, but eighty percent of the diet in this country is worms. Although they exist across the whole of Europe, and their diet varies from country to country depending what is available. Um, they will eat anything and everything um, that, that they come across. So they will eat small mammals, they will eat birds. They won't eat anything that involves any running or hunting because that's too much effort for them. And um, so if they stumble across things, great. If they um, if they can pick them up while they're just, you know, wandering along, then even better. But they won't go into the, the kind of carnivore hunting mode, even though technically they are a carnivore. Um, they eat an omnivorous diet. So um, you can see from this one, she's got the the carnivorous, oh, her teeth have got a bit cross, the carnivorous dentition there, very much like a dog or a fox, um, and the big nasal cavity. Um, they've got an incredible sense of smell. I can actually sniff, this This, this blows my mind. Um, they can sniff out worms underground. So can you imagine walking across a field and being able to smell the worms that you're walking over? <laughs> Isn't it? It's you crazy. know, it must completely change your perception of, of, of a place. You know, it just oof, blows my mind. <laughs> I'm quite impressed with the size of those teeth. I didn't realise that they're yeah. so well pronounced. Yeah, I mean, they're quite quite uh, powerful. But considering that actually they don't really eat anything that requires that sort of dentition really um, anymore, I guess, at some point in their evolution, maybe that was a, a larger part of their diet. All right, are the, are the badgers in Europe that are eating things other than worms, are they still like the same species of badgers we have here or are they...? Like yeah, ones. so we have the European badger that exists across the whole of Europe, but there are about six, I think six off the top of my head, species of badgers across the across the world. Um, so you've got your American, I won't, won't remember them all, I don't think, the American badger, the honey badger, um, Palawan badger, and oh, there's another one and I can't remember that. Um, but effectively they all sort of exist in the same ecological niche. And most of them primarily eat invertebrates um honey badgers it's not really the honey they're after it's the grubs in the in the in the um what would you call it nest that the, the honey is is found in so it's the grubs that they're after and um, the honey attracts them in and they, they go after the grubs um much like our badgers go after wasps nests this time of year they're digging out wasps all the time Amazing. Thanks for work. Uh, fascinating. So listeners at home, don't feel left out. Uh, links to the show and tell items will be in the description below, so you can have a look for yourself. Um, so you each picked kind of show and tell around your specialism or your area of interest. Um, I think, Amy, you did study marine biology. What do you find most fascinating about the subject? Um, I think just the, the diversity of life. I mean, I think when I started to, well, when I went to university studying studied marine biology, I was thinking it's quite specialist, isn't it? But actually, the more you learn about it, the more huge the topic is. I mean, when you think about it, like most of the planet is underwater, so it's not that surprising that there's such a diversity of life. Um, but even, you know, up here in Scotland, it's quite grey and miserable a lot of the time. But then when you go beneath the waves, it's just like a whole nother world. Um, and there's lots of like convergent evolution so lots of organisms that aren't related but are coming up with the same sort of answers to problems of surviving in different habitats um which is just amazing it's like it's like looking at aliens but 
on our planet um all the time so yeah yeah it's uh the diversity i think which which i really like yeah and i guess as you say there is so much to explore that new stuff is being learned all the time um, about it one of the things i think you mentioned is that you really appreciate the, the interconnectivity uh, between things in, in the marine habitat um any examples that you want to share with your listeners yeah so um i mean just yesterday uh, with a group we were looking we were taking plankton samples from um the pier um just, just outside the center so dragging nets through the water and having a look at the plankton um under microscopes and seeing what we could find um and it's amazing like the in the microscopic plankton you've got um stuff that lives the whole life in the plankton um but then you've also got like the sort of larval stages of a lot of animals so you'll have like the crab uh the crab baby crabs and baby starfish and lots of fish have a lot of a stage where they're in the plankton um, and that is sort of the basis of like all of the food chains in um, in the whole of the seas so um, when you think about all this microscopic stuff that the sea is full of um, that's feeding basically everything else in the oceans and some of the biggest things in the ocean uh, are fed by some of the smallest things in the ocean which is really and traveling all over and all those nutrients are passing all over going all around the world um and it's all like even though we think of us as having like different seas and different oceans actually there's only one ocean and it's all interconnected it's all interacting with each other all the time um which yeah i think is pretty cool yeah, i agree and i think cam you kind of said one of the reasons you studied the college or went down that route is to look at how things interact while they're still alive um what is it about freshwater ecology um, that you really enjoy? Um, yeah, I guess I think freshwater ecology is just one of those things that you kind of initially interact with. Um, I mean, if you if you I was lucky enough to do sort of wildlife clubs when I was a kid. I think you do pond dipping a lot when you're younger. Um, but for me, it was about that. Uh, when I did ecology at uni, there's it's such a broad topic, really, and I, I do enjoy how everything's interacting, but freshwater was sort of niche enough that I could uh, kind of have a look at a lot of what was going on. Um, mainly it was from working with the native species uh, native species team. We did the newt stuff, but we also did white claw crayfish um, sort of uh, breeding as well. So we had this big hatchery. My boss was like the lead white claw crayfish uh, person for the southwest. Um, so yeah, we had this huge hatchery at the zoo with all these little crayfish and then we were going out and bring them um, as well as managing the invasive American crayfish as well that's brought in which is the reason that our white claw native white claw isn't doing so well and part of that and the newts um, to know about our sort of uh, water quality the best thing to do is have a look at the uh, invertebrates that we've got in the, the other invertebrates that we've got in there so understanding what invertebrate sort of communities we have give us an idea of what's going on in the water and whether it's going to be able to look after the other animals that we've got on going there and then crayfish are really big food good food source for otters um and stuff like that and and we've got plenty of birds that use our, our water courses as well and then fish um and then you've got stuff like european eels and salmon that come back it's just such a big thing um and as you know even though we're such a small island we've got sort of really really important habitats and I think through my research realizing um, that ponds kind of were overlooked for a long time they were used sort of naturally in our um, farming for a long time um, and then as sort of farming became more industrialized and we could just water our crops whenever we needed to and we'd lost a lot of those ponds we lost a lot of that habitat connectivity I guess one thing you have with the ocean that's quite lucky is that it's all connected um, fresh water is less and less so all the time um we're losing those pond habitats and um yeah the best thing i always always try and encourage people is that the best thing you can do for wildlife in your garden right now is build a pond whether that's just put out a little basin that's filled with fresh water and a couple of plants um that will do more for wildlife than um a lot of other things that that, that you can do um just because it improves that connectivity frogs as they're traveling along trying to find new breeding areas or trying to find hibernating areas will stop off at your pond maybe um, or maybe they'll decide that they want to stay there so I just think yeah the, the more and more I look into it the more I find it interesting and, and amazing um, and that's just on the freshwater I've looked at and on this island let alone the rest of the world you know so yeah 
I don't know, I could chat about it forever, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, it's really interesting what you say about sort of creating um, those fresh water uh, habitats. My mum's actually just created a, a pond sort of at the bottom of her garden, and I had a little kind of dig around just because I was interested. It hasn't been there for that long, I think probably less than a year. And the amount of things that were in it, the invertebrates, the freshwater shrimp, the water boatmen, they're there already. And I'm like, wow, this is, um, this is really interesting. Yeah, I, I dug myself a pond. I was lucky enough to have a, a big enough garden. Dug myself a pond about a year ago now, thinking, well, you know, it'll do what it does, even with my, my knowledge. Knowing the houses around here and live quite near a road, didn't think I'd get any amphibians. Thought, I have, you know, invertebrates in there. Hopefully dragonflies will fly in. Um, had plenty of boatmen um, and pond skaters and then this year I've been looking at it and I've got tons of newts and I don't know where they've come from I don't know how they got there but I'm extremely happy about it I won't stop telling people about it um, but yeah they will I think it will really surprise you how much it can do they'll, they'll find their way there if it's there they'll find their way there yeah that's amazing um well I, you've got such a broad range of experience across nature and conservation what is it particularly about badgers that's really hooked you in? I don't know. Um, before, I, but, um, before I got the badger job, I've been working as a countryside ranger for many years, so I knew a little bit about lots of things. Um, and I've never had the opportunity really to specialise in one thing. Um, and when I got this job, which I purely got on the basis that one contract had finished and this job was advertised and I thought, I'll go for that, that looks interesting, and I was lucky enough to get it. Um, when I started in the job, I was kind of, oh my goodness, I've got all this stuff I have to learn about badgers. Um, but the more you learn, the more you want to learn. And initially it was just, you know, the tracking signs, the feel signs. Um, now I feel like I've had a real opportunity to learn so much about the animals themselves. And, and what one of the things that really fascinates me about them is the way they engineer the landscape. Um, when we go out looking for badger sets, Usually the, the tracking and the paths pull us into a set. Um, we find the set, we have a good look at that set. And then when you look around the area surrounding that set, um, if it's a set that's been there for many, many years, the entire landscape for, you know, not as far as you can see, but for 20 metres, 30 metres, 40 metres beyond the set that you're looking at, there are hummocks, there are grassy, grassed up kind of lumps in the ground. There are little holes that you're kind of like, oh gosh, you know, something used to live in there. Um, the whole shape of the landscape is just totally engineered by badgers. And on a, you know, a countryside scale across Scotland, large chunks of the landscape have been engineered by their activities. And it's not something that you think about until you put your head into that badger space and start well, when you learn to track badgers, you never go for a walk in the same way ever again. Suddenly, all the time, you're looking for badger paths, snuffle holes, um, any signs of foraging, any sets. And you just start looking at the landscape in a very different way. And it also leads you into things unrelated to badgers. So you, when you see something, you question it and you think, how did that get there? Rather than just accepting and walking past. You know, I was out this morning. There's a woodland just down the road from me that's got a badger set right alongside the path, right there um, where you can see it. I've walked that woodland with friends who have walked right past this badger set and never even looked at it, you know, never even blinked. And I'm kind of like, but, 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 but there's a huge badger set that you just walked past, you know, and I'm, I'm going looking down the holes and whatever. Um, and I think once you get your eyes opened up to that, you start questioning how does the countryside, how is it the way it is and what has made it that way? So what has made that tree die? Um, or why are there holes away up there at the top of the tree, but there's none low down at the base of the tree? Or, you know, it just, they've made me question the way I look at the countryside. I think that's that's part of it. Yeah, I think, you know, as people that are nature lovers and we like to spend time outdoors, um, it's really good to observe the countryside, maybe through slightly different eyes with the things that we see. Um, but I'm also sure sure that as nature lovers people have spent a lot of time outdoors that we've seen we've seen changes um, in biodiversity over time. Is there anything that stands out to you um, that you can think of? Just the vast amount of development um, that, that is going on roads and the impact that the building I, I drive up to Aberdeen quite a lot for, for um, one of my other jobs when I'm working with schools. And I drive up to Aberdeen and there's a lovely big new bypass, past Aberdeen, huge bypass. 
um, has made traveling to Aberdeen and around Aberdeen so much easier. But the damage, the environmental damage it has caused is quite phenomenal. Um, and when you think about how it's impacted on all the different animals that, that live in that area and all the different creatures that live in that area, I think, um, yeah, it's quite sad that we don't really put, we put our needs above the needs of the wildlife. So that, that road has bisected a number of badger habitats where they would travel from where they live to where they feed and they have either had to negotiate getting over that road. There have been some badger underpasses put in, but badgers being badgers don't necessarily use the bits that you've you've you provided for them. Um they will follow their their natural habitual paths and so we're getting more badger deaths up there on that road um at the moment. And then when you think about more general development, um the large areas of housing that's being put up. Again, you're not often destroying the habitat that they live in because that's forest. Woodland gets a degree of protection quite often. Um, not ideal for building on, but we are building on the fields that they forage in. Has no degree of protection at all. And then you're, you're, you're reducing their opportunities to find food. So then we're bringing them into conflict with people as well because they're now coming into these new gardens and these new, new housing estates and causing conflict. So that conflict that wouldn't have been there before is purely entirely man-made. And I think that's that's really, really sad. Yeah, it's certainly particularly the, the knock-on effect that it really has uh, on the badgers. Um, Amy, how about you? Any sort of anecdotal observations about changes in biodiversity over time? Um, I can't really say in terms of biodiversity because I've spent a lot of time living in lots of different places. So I can't say I've lived, uh, I've seen something go through a change, but what I have noticed um, throughout the last maybe like 10 years since I started really getting into spending a lot of time by the coast, um, I've noticed changes in the sorts of litter that we get washing up. Um, so um, yeah, so, you know, like 10 years ago when, plastic bags were free at supermarkets. They were everywhere. You'd always find plastic bags on the beaches. And I don't know whether this is reflected in the data or not, but I feel like I see a lot less plastic bags like lying on the beach. Um, throughout COVID, I uh, definitely saw different sort of uh, rubbish washing up. So lots of PPE um, starting to appear, lots of those um, disposable disposable masks um, that uh, got washed up as well. Um, and then at the minute as well, we're starting to find uh, I remember when we first started to find like coffee pods as well, which for some reason always end up in the sea. Um, so you can sort of see how things start to start to encroach on the marine environment. Um, and at the minute, what's, we're finding quite a lot of the things like disposable vapes, um, which obviously have not been around that long, um, but you know, almost immediately they're straight into the sea, um, which is a real shame. Um, but I mean, I guess on the good side is that over the last 10 years, I've also noticed that it seems to be a bit more cool these days for people to be interested in wildlife and wanting to do things to help wildlife. So um, there's a crazy statistic about how much litter was picked up on around the world on a single day um, in one year. Um, but people are doing their bit much more than they would have done um, to help their marine environment. They care about things, they want to learn about things, and it's not super geeky um, anymore to be like interested in tiny things that live in ponds or little barnacles um there's a much more i don't know i feel like we're turning back to nature a little bit um in our sort of attitudes so that's a good thing good and about good and bad things <laughs> i think that was the biggest thing i was going to say the biggest thing i noticed is a change in societal like exposure to stuff and i think nowadays the you have such good access to information using apps like seek or iNaturalist or you know there's so many things to even just like google lens to help you id things gives people that power to be like wow actually i do want to know what this is and i do want to see what this is and they get so much more engaged and then they're realizing that in terms of yeah like i, I think similar to amy biodiversity change personally i don't think I, i've seen a lot but um and, but it's difficult because the more you learn, you know, I did a bit quite a lot of work with invasive species and now I can't walk down the street without seeing some sort of invasive species. But is that because there's more there or is it just because now I know what they look like? Um, but it's definitely something I'm, I'm much more aware of. And I think that hopefully it's weird because I think the changes have come, you know, my granddad's 
um, super into, you know, he's always emailing me asking about what's in his pond, but he's kind of always been into the environment. But I think when he was younger, he was like, oh yeah, well, we'd always just go out and we'd put frog spawn in our pockets and then we'd take it home and we'd put it in a jar and that we'd grow it at home and we'd, they'd always be around. And I think there's a generational thing of people growing up saying, well, not realizing how much biodiversity has actually declined in their lifetime and assuming that the things that we're doing now, a lot of people complain about, I guess, similar to badgers, newts, great crested newts still have quite a high level of protection, even though great crested newts are relatively widespread, it's really important that them and their habitats are still protected and that we don't develop on their land uh, where we can because there's just so much other habitat involved, but people complain about that because they want to build the houses and they think that it's a silly thing to stop, um, to stop that. Um, but I think if the more knowledge that you give to people and the more they realize actually it's not just this one little animal that you're saving, it's not it's everything else that goes along with that and attitudes towards that are hopefully hopefully improving. I think funding for ecology is improving and funding for research is improving. So I hope that we're only gonna see improvements from here, but I know that maybe we're a little bit too far gone in some aspects. You never know. What do we think? climate change in your kind of respective areas um any potential impacts that you've seen about or you can kind of see happening in the future whether that be positive or negative i think for, i mean from in, in my specific kind of badgery field um climate change weather the way the weather is impacting um on badgers last summer we had such a long hot dry summer and um, badgers we had uh, we had the potential we the, the numbers haven't been done but the potential that we lost a lot more badgers just through starvation um their primary food source being worms went way deep underground into the damp soil and they wouldn't have the opportunity to catch them um, and then we have the the reverse of that we have these incredible kind of flash floods that that happen and these again have an impact on badgers in their homes and and how they they're not particularly keen on being get having wet feet you know and you know their their sets ending up in if they're in areas and they do build sets in places you would think are pretty pretty daft but you know the the set in the riverbank that gets flooded um because the badger has decided that the riverbank is the, the place to build a set and it'll get flooded um so i think i think that the the i i the way I see it, the dramatic changes in the weather that I'm certainly seeing, feel like I'm seeing myself in the last maybe five or ten years, are having a big knock-on effect on, on badgers and, and other wildlife. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, though a lot of sort of freshwater species, especially pond species, are will be adapted to that periodical drying. The longer that those ponds are dry for... Um, will really struggle. And the sooner that that's happening, like I said, if the newts are breeding in sort of March, April, and if they're drying out in June, they're not going to have an opportunity to grow up or at all and feed properly to be able to survive. So those, I think, weather is definitely one of the biggest things changing. Um, and then you're just getting increased pollution with, with you know, those floods. Um, and, yeah, I think it is kind of... Um, I was watched this talk the other day about how climate change is affecting um, invasive species as well and it's changing the environment so that yeah the niche is, is changing and our native species aren't as well adapted as some invasive species are and it's just improving the conditions for, for them and really they're they're changing those habitats so much um, so I think that that's probably the biggest thing we're going to see is movement of communities and changes in in what what species we've got and whether that's um, more invasive species or not. Um, yeah, I think that's much more likely to happen with the, with the changing climate. So a bit of a lose-lose situation there. Unfortunately, yeah. Amy, what about from a marine perspective? Any thoughts? Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty scary out there with all the changes that are happening. I mean, in terms of the rocky shore, one of the reasons that it's such a diverse place is because it's quite extreme conditions anyway. So in a normal year, things on the shore are having to cope with the tides coming in and out, coming out at different times. Sometimes the rock pools in the summer will be like heated up to like 30 degrees. Uh, sometimes in the winter, the rock pools might freeze. There's changes in salinity. So the pretty tough things that can live in those rock pools and they're adapted to a certain point. They've got very sort of wide margins of what they can survive in. So if we think about our barnacles, 
they need to be able to survive in lots of different conditions. But there is a point where they're just not going to be able to survive. So if those rock pools get even hotter, if they go up to 40, 50 degrees in the really hot sun, everything's just going to start dying off. Um, and if we start to lose some species, that has knock on effects all the way up the food chain, um, which could spell out some very bad times. And then course in the oceans as well with climate change we've also got um, the threat of ocean acidification which will affect all the sort of tiny planktonic things all the things with those calcium carbonate shells um which won't be able to survive um so it's it's not good it's not good um at all for the for the marine uh, environment either and these um extreme weather events as well so you know the really dry summer that we've summers that we've been having that increases the sea temperature too like it's resilient to a point uh, but it will be able it will eventually heat up the seas and this year we were hearing a lot about the sort of marine heat wave that happened um and again like the flash floods um although the water does go to the sea as it washes down through all the rivers and over all the farmland um that's bringing everything else that's on that land as well so all those um added nutrients causing big changes to the environment in the sea as well so um yeah it's a uh, not not the best, let's say. <laughs> but rather than end on the not the best news, um, I think maybe if we end on picking up what our most interesting fact has been for today, it can't be one of your own facts. Um, my favourite word for today is snuffle holes. Um, so I'm going to start with that. Um, Ulrich, how about you? Oh gosh, a salamander. Salamander, I think I've, I've never seen anything like it. Um, I don't even really know what salamanders are, you know. Um, so that was that was fascinating. Awesome, Amy. Um, yeah, I found out that badgers can smell worms. I don't, I wouldn't, <laughs> I don't think I'd even know what a worm smells like. So to smell them through the ground as well is, um, yeah, quite quite impressive. Yeah, no, no sniffing worms next time you get on your cup. <laughs> <laughs> Cam, what about you? Um, well, just to make it even, and, and actually what I did work, seeing those barnacles was um, was so interesting. The fact that you could just, you just picked them up from the rocky shore, brought them in and put them in a in a case with some seawater and, and there they are. I just have, yeah, I've always looked at them and I tell the kids all the time, yeah, they're alive and, you know, don't be trying to scrape them off the rocks, but I've never actually seen them feeding. So that was really cool. Before we sign off today, there are two segments that we hope you will find interesting. First up is Ellie Sutton, a tutor at Field Studies Council Netacombe on the edge of Exmoor National Park, to tell us about sustainability in the organisation and links back to nature. Hi, I'm Ellie and I work as a seasonal tutor at Nettlecombe Court. We are lucky enough to be situated on a beautiful estate on the border of the Exmoor National Park in Somerset and we are surrounded by an array of wildlife. Our ancient woodland is home to some impressive oak trees that encompass Nettlecombe's spectacular history, so this makes it the perfect location to study the natural world. To help boost biodiversity and reduce our centre's greenhouse gas emissions, we're in the process of building and installing an industrial-sized wormery on site as part of the Green Fund project. The UK alone generates around 9.5 million tonnes of food waste each year and when disposed of in landfill, releases methane into the atmosphere. Agricultural practices used to produce the food we consume can have negative impacts on biodiversity, so it seems such a shame that so much of it is wasted. Our aim is to encourage less food to be wasted at our centre and to process any of it that is in the wormery. The food waste will be digested by brandling worms, which are well adapted to decaying organic matter and thrive in rotting vegetation and compost, therefore providing a natural solution to dealing with our food scraps. During digestion, the worms will produce a nutrient-rich compost and liquid fertiliser, which we will collect in a repurposed sink basin at the bottom of the wormery structure. Repurposed wood will also be used as part of the structure and there will be a perspex front to engage our customers and allow us to observe the worms working their magic. We intend on using the compost in our wildlife garden to help encourage wildflowers and plants. And by helping various plant species to grow, Pollinators and other insects can be encouraged on our grounds. Silver wash fritillaries, marbled whites and holly blues are just some of the butterfly species we see here at Nettlecombe. The liquid fertiliser from the wormery can be used to grow vegetables in our polytunnels and vegetable patches, which staff members and volunteers consume. 
We hope in turn that this project will inspire others to install a wormery and discover how easy it is to compost naturally whilst encouraging biodiversity. Thanks to Ellie for sharing that information. That is just a small snippet of what Phil Studies Council is doing to support biodiversity. We also have a short segment from Jenny Lewis, Education Team Leader at Phil Studies Council Amersham. Jenny has worked for the organisation for 17 years and has a few thoughts she'd like to share on the benefits of outdoor learning. What are the benefits to young people for doing ecological studies outdoors? Well, having the chance to, first of all, get out of your local area is a great opportunity for many, particularly post-pandemic. Some students have missed out on the opportunity to go on school trips a bit lower down the school. So for them, getting a chance to be outdoors, to go somewhere different, to go to a different part of the country, or even for us, it's just 25 miles from central London. For them, it can be such a different experience. They're in a different habitat, different environment, seeing all sorts of different things. So there's lots of social benefits for that taking care of yourself, working with your friends, working in a team, walking on different surfaces. Even some of our, the young visitors that come to us haven't even really walked on grass or on twiggy paths before. So that's a whole other load of benefits. We all know that young children like to be uh, outdoors in nature, catching bugs. It's all very exciting, but it's really great to see older students having those opportunities too. It doesn't really matter if you're seven if you're, or if you're 17. If you're catching tadpoles in the ponds with your friends, to be honest, the excitement level is pretty much the same, the level of squealing. Some of the questions they ask are, are much the same as the young children as well. Doing some ecological studies is a real opportunity for the students to get kind of hands-on and to look really closely at so many of the different organisms. If you're identifying species by looking at their leaf shape, for example, and counting the abundance in your quadrat, then you've actually got a really good opportunity to kind of almost become mindful. You're down there looking at the plants, listening to the wind in the trees, smelling the pine trees, listening to the different sounds of the birds, tasting the wood sorrel and feeling the rain on your hood whilst you record your data. Those are really good opportunities to just kind of get stuck in. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why us as ecologists really enjoy doing it as well. Finally, a big thank you to Amy, Cam and Morag for joining me today and for your input to the audio programme for Biology Week. Bye. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Listeners at home, we'd love to see your comments on what you've heard today. So get involved via social media using hashtag Biology Week. If you have enjoyed our programme today and want to find out more, please look at Field Studies Council website for details. Uh, Links can be found in the description below to our dedicated Biology Week page, as well as to our publications, training and teaching opportunities.